trust us. We tell good stories. We're not afraid to throw, um, um, to put people under pressure and shine a spotlight on things. Um, and we, we celebrate Aboriginal people and it becomes a culture of once a month, when's the paper coming out, um, I want to read the stories. Let's talk a bit about National Indigenous Times now. Could you tell us the story about how you came to acquire the National Indigenous Times? And as you've gone from someone who's initially bought an existing business there, and obviously existing media outlet, and how it's since transformed and, and what you think its future looks like. Well, there's a bit of a story. You see, you see, being a CEO of a land council, Clinton, uh, my co-partner in NIG, we have had our fair share of media belting us for nothing. They listen to, media's listen to one side of the story and believe it and want to just tell that story and don't tell a balanced story. And so at some point, Clinton says, um, we were dealing with some conflict and criticism. He says, we should own our own paper so we can tell our own story. And then as the planets lined up, I talked to Tony Barras, and he eventually rung me and said, um, why don't we buy into National Indigenous Times? And then... There was a group of us looking at it. We went over and talked to the owners of National Indigenous Times. I mean, we looked at the paper and just thought it was a terrible little rag. And, um, but it had a brand. And like everything I've learned about branding is it's okay to have a terrible brand and it's easy to fix a terrible brand up. Um, you can make give, give it more punch. And so there was a group of us chucking in money because National Indigenous Time, not long after that, went into administration. Um, there were bankruptcy proceedings against them, and then they were going to be liquidated. So we went in a bidding process. And I this was our Alan Bond, um, Kerry Packer moment, where during the bidding process, we bidded something like 100 grand to buy it. And we were outbidded by, the, uh, during this process, people were trying to roll us. Um, don't let them get hold of it. Like, brother, there was comments on Facebook and different things. And so we didn't get it. The administrators thought they had got someone with cash and they couldn't come up with cash. And then our little syndicate that we had together uh, fell apart. And then Tony Brass came back to me later and said, Wayne, it didn't sell. It's still on the table. Are you still interested? I said, yes. Um, I'll do it with you. But how much, what, what's the issue? Well, I've spoken to them and they said there is $4,000, about $2,000 time whip work in progress on their sheets. They want to get that money back plus legal costs. And I said, go back to them, ask them for a fixed price, and we'll pay cash straight up. And so they came back and said, here, $2,000 legal costs, so 4000 all up. So my Stokes and um, Packer and Alan Bond moment, and we bought it for $4,000. It was just a mask head. There was nothing there. We got a whole lot of computer files and old stories and all that. And then Tony set to work and rebrand it. And we started off with a very slow burn, putting up some stories, paying, get, getting, we were very excited. We got, you know, our first $200 ad. And then I can remember getting phone calls from Tony saying, oh, we're getting, you know, $1,000 a month. You know, we're getting excited. And it just grew from that. And mate, hard work like um, making those stories come out, creating volume, creating the content that people, content people would read, getting people interested in investing in it. And then um, Tony, we approached Tony, um, Clinton and I, because my shares was half with Clinton. And then we said, we'll pay you out. And we went through a process and we paid Tony out. 
um, to become 100% Indigenous owned. And then we've we've grown from there, and it's been a bit of a fairy sta- fairy tale growth strategy. I think we're doing a million readers or viewers a month um, going through all our online stuff. So, um, but I think why what's driven us is wanting to tell Indigenous stories, um, wanting to tell positive Indigenous stories, because. And we wanted to focus on more positive than negative. And we also believe that there's this natural tension between Aboriginal people in business and development um, and our inherent values about conservation and cultural management. There's this this tension and we try to find a balance between traditional owners wanting to do deals on country and traditional owners wanting to look after the company and how you find the balance. Because traditionally... People use natural resources to make materials and things to survive in their traditional economy. Why should Aboriginal people be frozen in time and not be able to use their natural resources to better their family and their society? And so from that conversation with you and Clinton Wolf about wanting to tell more Aboriginal stories to the broader Australian people, the growth of the NIT since then, what do you you think the media landscape looks like, particularly for the National Indigenous Times in, in the coming years? I think, we, I think we've got to um, expand and have more of a nas- uh, international footprint. I think the world is hungry for Indigenous stories. Um, industry, like it or not, are a major partner in this process to tell our stories. Um, I think government should re-look at, uh, I don't think ABC and SBS tell good Indigenous stories. They get a whole lot of money. We don't, we have to generate our own money and we have to compete. Um, SBS can get government funding to tell the stories, but we don't have same access to it. So there's not a level playing fair to compete in this market and that needs to be reviewed. So um, that, we are successful because of our relationship also with the big tech companies. See, ultimately, I think NIT might be a news outlet, but ultimately we're a technology company because we're trying to distribute content to people for free through technology. And so it's important to be able to deliver that content as much as possible to as many Aboriginal people as possible. But I also hear that from people giving me feedback, a lot of non-Indigenous people read our paper, love the content. So I think we've got a good melting pot, a lot more women reading our paper, um, but also a lot more professional people. So I, I think by default, we're, we're, we've always got an open door for more Aboriginal people to talk to us to tell their stories. Thank you.